Hello, everyone. Welcome to St. Peter and St. Paul United Church of Christ. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. We thank you for tuning in to worship with us today in our online worship. And uh, Joel and Mary Beth and Aaron Westermeyer are here with us. Uh, the music, the hymn singing will be uh, a cappella. Uh, we are still in purple. Uh, we're still maintaining some social distancing. And uh, so our music uh, is approached a little differently this week as it was last week. Uh, but we uh, hope that our service will uh, bless you and that uh, uh, you will be prepared for a, a new week ahead uh, with spiritual nourishment. So thank you for tuning in. Let us prepare our hearts and our minds now for the worship of God. I invite you to join me in our responsive call to worship. We gather to respond to the call of God's love. Thankful that someone cared enough to share this good news with us. May we be compassionate enough to share this divine presence with others. Love, when shared, is not divided, but multiplied. Love, given away, is not diminished, but expanded. May our gathering beckon and welcome those near and far to know the love of this divine presence. Our first hymn is hymn number 86, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is Thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Blessings all mine with ten thousand beasts. 
side. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Our invocation today is responsive. I will read the first part, and I invite you to join me uh, in praying the bold type. From deep within us, we know of a loving presence. All around us, we see glory, beauty, life, and light. We have no words for what we experience, so we cry out, God. In this moment of worship, may that loving presence grow deeper, and may our awareness of the divine presence around us grow more intense. May we, gathered in this place, learn to pay more attention to God, who loves us at all times and in all places. God of love and life, in this moment of prayer, be more and more in us, so that we might live more and more in you. Amen. The psalmist writes, For God alone my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from Him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. Our lives become shaken when we disconnect ourselves from God and when we refuse to answer God's call in our lives. Let us now confess our sin and welcome God's forgiveness. Please join me in our prayer of confession. Holy, Holy One, one what, what a blessing, blessing and privilege we share here in this sacred space and among this loving community. But like Jonah, we sometimes are jealous of what we share here. We know that others are longing and thirsting for what we know and experience. Forgive our reluctance to open our doors and open our hearts to others, some like us and some not. We repent of our hesitations and unwillingness to witness to those we have considered strangers and even enemies, for fear that they might just become friends. Amen. The one who calls us to this place calls us to reconciliation through grace. God will not deny a repentant heart or an open spirit. Know that you are forgiven and walk in the new way that is made known to you in God's love. Amen. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And now we come to our time of pastoral prayer, and I would invite you to lift up those needs and concerns that you have that you bring to worship here today. And I also invite you, if you would like to submit an online prayer request, that you uh, use the link that is uh, just below the video, and we will make sure that we add that prayer request to our weekly email uh, prayer list, and we will lift those concerns up uh, together in prayer as a congregation. Uh, let us remember uh, our nation as uh, we continue to face the pandemic and all of the challenges that come with that. Uh, recently we passed the 400,000 mark. Over 400,000 of our fellow Americans have died uh, from COVID-related illness and our hearts go out to their families, to their loved ones, and uh, we are very uh, mindful of uh, that number. And uh, it's a very sobering reminder of uh, how much has uh, uh, been affected uh, by the COVID pandemic, how many lives have been affected, and how many families are grieving uh, loved ones. So let us pray for, uh, for all of those uh, loved ones, of those who have uh, 
uh, been taken from us because of COVID-related illnesses. Let's also continue to pray for all who are infected by COVID and uh, all of those who are offering their love and support to them. Uh, this past week, we uh, celebrated Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Uh, this past Monday, let us uh, remember the legacy of Dr. King and his challenge to us to uh, build a more just and inclusive and welcoming and uh, hopeful society. Let us uh, continue to commit ourselves to that important work. Also this week, we uh, saw the inauguration of our 46th president, and let us pray for our new president and new vice president, uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Let us pray for our outgoing uh, president, Donald Trump and our outgoing Vice President Mike Pence. And let us pray for all of our leaders in government. And uh, we pray for uh, a, a more peaceful time and a time in which we can uh, foster and nurture greater understanding among our citizens during these, uh, uh, what have often been a very tense and uh, a difficult time. Let us pray for peace in our land and peace in our world. And let us now go to God in prayer. O oh Lord, you have come to us. You have come to us looking neither for wealthy nor wise ones. You only ask us to follow you humbly. Our gospel reading for today paints a picture of regular people, hard-working people going about their daily tasks when they are confronted by Jesus. And this same Jesus who long ago called to those first disciples calls to each of us today. And the places where you call us, O Lord, may be different from theirs, but the call is the same, the call to come and follow you. They are the places where we work and where we live, and we are reminded that Jesus is coming for each one of us, just as we are, and inviting us to follow him humbly. Today, Lord, we've lifted the, uh, those up who uh, are in need of prayer, those friends and loved ones, We've lifted up our nation during the challenges that we face and during these times of transition that we are in. And we pray for your presence and your guidance and for your healing love. O oh God, you hear all of our prayers, all of our cries, all of our needs, all of our joys and concerns, and you respond in love. And we thank you for that. And we pray that you would bless the work of your church as we strive together to carry out the mission that you have called us to be about. We ask, O Lord, for your healing mercy and your blessings. And as we have offered our prayers, let us also offer our lives to you, trusting in your love and your call to us, responding to you with yes, with a big yes, and with confidence and with hope. And now in these moments of silence, we ask that you would hear the prayers that each of us bring to you. And now let us pray in song. Lord, listen to your children praying. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send us love. Send us power, send us grace. All of our prayers we offer to you, O Lord, and in the name of Jesus, and with the prayer that he taught us when he said, Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes from the Old Testament book of Jonah, chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up 
Go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Our next scripture reading is our gospel reading from Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, beginning at verse 14. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing and the understanding of this God's holy word. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Deciding to take up jogging, uh, there was a man who, astound, who was astounded by the wide selection of jogging shoes available at the local sporting goods store. While trying on a pair, a basic pair of jogging shoes, he noticed a minor feature and asked the clerk, what is this little pocket thing here on the side for? Oh, uh, the clerk said, oh, that's to carry spare change so that you can call your wife to come pick you up when you've jogged too far. That's a very old joke, I, I would say, isn't it? Uh, I, there aren't many pay phones around anymore. I'd like to share some moments of two of my favorite films. The first is from the film Forrest Gump. You remember young Forrest. Uh, he was born with a physical challenge. His back and his legs were not straight and he is fitted with braces to help him walk. Over time, it seems, his legs are strengthened by the braces and while he's being chased by bullies, young Forrest runs and he runs very fast and we see his braces falling off as he runs from the bullies and we realize that Forrest no longer needs the braces to help him get to where he wants to go. As Forrest is running, we hear his dear friend Jenny calling out to him, and what does she say? Run, run Forrest, run. run. Exactly. Hey, you all are good. We didn't even rehearse that, and they, they came through here for me. Later, when Forrest is a teenager, he's once again pursued by bullies, and we hear a teenage Jenny calling to him the same words. Run, Forrest, run. Very good. And in the film Monty Python and the Holy Grail, one of my favorite films of all time, we find King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table warning each other whenever being confronted by danger. And what do they say? Run away! Run away! And that seemed to be Jonah's model too. Run away! Run away! And run, Jonah! Run! Now why did Jonah run? Jonah ran because God was calling him to be a prophet and to speak prophetic words to the people of Nineveh. God was calling the people of Nineveh to repent. And God was offering them salvation. God was calling everybody, it seemed. He was calling the people of Nineveh to turn their lives around, and He was calling Jonah to go and to proclaim His word to the Ninevites. But Jonah was not fond of the Ninevites. He didn't like them at all. And he was not particularly keen to go and to be God's prophet uh, of repentance and salvation to these people that he didn't like. And so Jonah fled. Jonah ran. Jonah said, run away. And so he ran away. We've heard the story since we were children, but it never ceases to amaze and fascinate us. 
Jonah flees. He pays to board a ship to Joppa on its way to Tarshish. And Jonah is convinced that he can flee the presence and the call of God. Isn't that an interesting assumption that we all make sometimes? If we just don't listen to God speaking to me, I won't hear God's call to follow Christ and to change my ways and my attitudes. If I just ignore God's call long enough, maybe He won't demand that I, I turn my prejudices and my fears over to Him and start looking at people in the world differently. That's how we think. That's what we convince ourselves of. Jonah was convinced of that. Jonah had it all planned out. I'll get on a boat and flee God's presence, and then I won't have to deal with those Ninevites I dislike so much. After all, why would I want to help them repent and receive God's mercy? They have what's coming to them, and I hope they suffer. That's what Jonah was thinking. But it did not matter where Jonah went. It didn't matter how far Jonah ran. God was right behind him and pursuing Jonah every step of the way. God sent a storm that threatened the ship that Jonah was on. And after a while, the captain and the sailors realized through Jonah's own admission that the calamity they were facing was, bega was because God was trying to get Jonah's attention. Jonah finally said to the crew of the ship, Pick me up, throw me into the sea, and then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great storm has come upon you. Well, the crew tried to steer the boat to safety, but the storm grew worse. And finally, they followed Jonah's advice and threw him into the sea. And the sea became calm and the weather became calm. And the crew of the ship believed in God and worshipped and sacrificed and made vows. They became believers that day. But Jonah, we are told, that Jonah was swallowed up by a large fish that God provided. And Jonah spent the next three days and three nights in the belly of that large fish. Jonah, in his loneliness and in his despair, prayed to God. And Jonah was now the one doing the repenting. Jonah recognized that only God could pull him out of his misery and out of the terrible predicament he found himself in. Jonah was also realizing that he could not hide from God's call in his life. He could not hide from God's presence. It didn't, far, it didn't matter how far he tried to run, he could never flee God's presence. Jonah was also learning that just as he could not hide from his, his, his could not hide from God, he also could not hide from his Ninevite neighbors. The neighbors God was calling him to minister to. The neighbors God was calling him to uh, bring the word of mercy to. What, is, uh, what, was, what was Jonah thinking? He thought he could flee from God. He thought he could flee from his Ninevite neighbors. And he could just do whatever he wanted to do. But God pursued him. God had a call for Jonah. God had a plan for Jonah. And God was determined that Jonah would follow through on that call and would, would answer that call. It's amazing when we think about it, the extent to which Jonah would go. What is God calling us to do today in, the light, in light of Jonah's story? There are many things we're called to do individually and collectively. One of the things the story of Jonah suggests to us is that our calling as the people of God is to engage with those who are different than we are and to try to understand those who are different than we are. Jonah would have been fine to let the Ninevites just perish, but God insisted that he was not going to allow that to happen. And Jonah was indeed called to go and engage with those neighbors he did not like, he did not trust, and those he feared. This has been a busy and intense January, hasn't it? Martin Luther King Jr. Day was this past Monday. And Dr. King continues to inspire and to inform us about our shared humanity and the need to work for justice and for freedom for all of God's children. Dr. King said, We must come to see that the end we seek is a society at peace with itself, a society that can live 
with its conscience. Dr. King called us to live up to the promises of our democracy and the ideals of our Constitution. He reminded us that the mission of liberty and justice for all is not an easy task, but one that we must always be engaged in, one that God calls us to always we be engaged in. And we're, we were reminded on uh, this last Monday, on Martin Luther King Day, uh, that there, remains, uh, there remain deep divisions in our land, deep distrust and deep misunderstandings. Are we going to answer God's call to engage with our neighbors? Or will we be like Jonah and shun our neighbors and go to great lengths to avoid them? Inauguration Day took place on Wednesday. Our nation went through the process of the transfer of power between presidential administrations and in this case, between political parties. But we were once again reminded of the deep divisions that have become embedded in American society. We are still processing the events of January 6th in which our federal Capitol building was stormed and occupied. And modifications were made to the usual inaugural celebrations due not only to the concerns of COVID-19, but also due to security questions. Part of our nation celebrated the inauguration of a new president and vice president, and part of our nation experienced disappointment and, among some, anger and resentment. Some in our nation have been calling for a new civil war. We actually have folks in our society who are uh, calling and seeking to instigate a new civil war, a literal civil war in which Americans would fight each other and blood would be shed, and some even revel in that idea. Now, you and I have read about the Civil War of the 1860s. I don't think many of us are too keen on the idea of engaging in a civil war with our fellow citizens. Giving up on each other in such a manner is the easy way out. It is the easy way out of, a, of division and distrust to just uh, go at war with each other. I do not believe that God is calling us to civil war or continued hatred or continued distrust. Jonah's experience reminds us that God calls us to respond to the divine call, including the call to be engaged with and in community with our neighbors, including those neighbors we might not like, including those neighbors we might not trust, including those neighbors we might disagree with, including those neighbors who may look different than we do. I have a proposal for you uh, as we uh, are wrapping up this, this week of inauguration this past week. Here's my proposal. If you voted for former President Trump, and you're feeling disappointed and hurt and angry that he is no longer president, go ahead and feel what you feel. No one can deny your feelings. But do not lash out and do not let your disappointment and hurt or anger cause you to hate your neighbor who voted differently than you did. And if you voted for President Biden and you are feeling glad and happy and in a celebratory mood, go ahead and feel what you feel. No one can deny your feelings, but do not gloat nor humiliate others. And do not let your joy lead you to hate your neighbor who voted differently than you did. And whichever side of the political aisle you are on, do not run from your neighbors as Jonah ran from his neighbors. Do not avoid your neighbors. Do not get caught up in a bubble where you only communicate with people who are like-minded and cast aspersions on those of a different mind. Jonah reminds us not to run from God and to not run from our neighbors. Erskine White says this about the story of Jonah. The story is about tolerance and understanding. It says that God is the God of all people. God loves Nineveh as much as Jerusalem, Moscow as much as Middle America. So who are the people or even the individuals you despise and distrust? 
Can you see that they are as important to God as you are? Can we all be like Jonah, getting to know them better as people? The story is about saying yes to God's call. Where is the Nineveh God has called you to enter and, I, and me to enter? The situation God calls us to, which we would rather stay away from. Have we not run away from our own great cities? And where do we think we can hide from the persistent call of the Lord God Almighty? Erskine White says. In Mark's Gospel, we find Jesus extending a call and inviting people, eventually people from all walks of life, to join him in building his new community. Jesus said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus' new community was built with the very devout and those who were considered unacceptable by the religious leaders of the day. His new community was made up of those who answered his call, including those on opposite sides of the political spectrum of his day. And, uh, tax collectors like Matthew, who worked for the Roman government, and zealots like Simon the Zealot, who were radically devoted to the strict practices of Judaism and the rituals of the temple. Jesus did not call people to engage in civil war. Jesus called people to join him in proclaiming and living out the kingdom of God, to repent and to believe the good news. Richard Gribble tells this story. He says, The bishop of Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris was known to be a great evangelist and preacher who would reach out to unbelievers, scoffers, and cynics. He liked to tell the story of a young man who many years earlier stood outside the cathedral and almost on a daily basis would shout derogatory slogans at people entering the church to worship. He would call them fools and all kinds of names. The people tried to ignore him, but it was very difficult. One day, the cathedral's rector went outside to confront the young man. The young man ranted and raved against everything the priest told him. After some time, the rector addressed the young man, saying, Look, let's get this over with once and for all. I'm going to dare you to do something, and I will bet you cannot do it. Of course, the young man responded, I can do anything that you propose, just try me. Fine, said the priest. I want you to follow me into the church sanctuary. The man followed the priest who stopped at the foot of a large figure of Christ on the cross. He said to the young man, I want you to look at the cross and scream at the very top of your lungs as loudly as you can. Christ died on the cross for me and I don't care one bit. So the young man went into the sanctuary, looked at the cross, and screamed as loudly as he could, Christ died on the cross for me, and I don't care one bit. The priest said, very good, now do it again. And again the young man screamed, but with some hesitancy this time, Christ died on the cross for me, and I don't care one bit. The priest again complimented the young man, saying, You are almost done now, but for good measure, say it one more time. And this time the young man raised his fist, looked at the statue, but the words would not come out. He just could not look at the face of Christ and say those words any longer. Then, to the surprise of all who were listening to the bishop's story, he said, I was that young man. I was that young man, defiant, who thought he did not need Christ, but found that I could not live without him. A dramatic story of repentance and believing the good news and a powerful story of transformation. What can happen in our world, sisters and brothers in Christ? What might happen in our world if we will just answer the call that God's extending to us now? The call to follow God to follow Christ wherever he leads us, and the call to engage with our neighbors as the call that Jonah received. Sisters and brothers, as we hear God's call, we have a choice to make. Are we going to run from God and our neighbors and fall into the traps of anger and bitterness and distrust and bigotry and hatred and fear? Or will we learn to answer God's call with a resounding yes? 
and repent and believe the good news and spend our time and our energy and our resources engaging with God and our neighbors. When Jonah finally answered God's call, the city of Nineveh was saved. The city of Nineveh, Nineveh was changed and God's power and God's grace were revealed. When we answer God's call to us, we won't be talking about civil war anymore. We won't be talking about divisions anymore. We'll be talking about life and hope and reconciliation and peace and love. Amen. I invite you to join me in affirming our faith as we say together the United Church of Christ Statement of Faith in its orig original version. We believe in God, the eternal Spirit, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and our Father, and to His deeds we testify. He calls the worlds into being, creates man in His own image, and sets before Him the ways of life and death. He seeks in holy love to save all people from aimlessness and sin. He judges men and nations by His righteous will, declared through prophets and apostles. In Jesus Christ, the man of Nazareth, our crucified and risen Lord, he has come to us and shared our common lot, conquering sin and death and reconciling the world to himself. He bestows upon us his Holy Spirit, creating and renewing the church of Jesus Christ, binding and covenant faithful people of all ages, tongues, and races. He calls us into his church to accept the cost and joy of discipleship to be his servants in the service of men, to proclaim the gospel to all the world and resist the powers of evil, to share in Christ's baptism and eat at his table, to join him in his passion and victory. He promises to all who trust him forgiveness of sins and fullness of grace, courage in the struggle for justice and peace, his presence in trial and rejoicing, and eternal life in his kingdom which has no end. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto him. Amen. Our next hymn is hymn number 337, Jesus Calls Us, O'er the Tumult. Jesus calls us o'er the tumult of our lives while restless sea. Day by day his sweet voice soundeth saying, Christian, follow me. Long ago, apostles heard it by the Galilean lake. Turn from home and toil and kindred, leaving all for his dear sake. Jesus calls us from the worship of the vain world's golden store from each idol that would keep us saying christian love me more in our joys and in our sorrows days of toil and hours of ease still he calls in cares and pleasures Christian, love me more than these. Jesus calls us by thy mercy, Savior, may we hear thy call. Give our hearts to thine obedience, serve and love thee best of all. And now we prepare for our, the blessing of our offering. Gestures of gratitude are a demonstration that a blessing or benefit has been received. We heard a call, dropped our nets, and came to this place to find new life. The gifts we give today are but tokens of the blessings of the new life we live in Christ. Bring your gifts with joy, for they remind us of just how blessed we are to know this love that flows so generously from the Spirit of God.
praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Please join me in our prayer of dedication. May these, these gifts, gifts given to these, these ministries of grace be a blessing to friends and strangers, those like us and those not, those deserving and those not. For in this way, the love of God reaches all of God's beloved. Amen. Our final hymn is hymn number 464, God of Grace and God of Glory. God of grace and God of glory, on thy people pour thy power. Crown thine ancient church's story, bring its bud to glorious flower. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of this hour. For the facing of this hour. Lo, the hosts of evil round us scorn thy Christ, assail thy ways. From the fears that long have bound us, free our hearts to faith and praise. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the living of these days, for the living of these days. Cure thy children's warring madness, bend our pride to thy control. Shame our wanton selfish gladness, rich in things and poor in soul. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, lest we miss thy righteous goal. Lest we miss thy righteous goal. Set our feet on lofty places, fill our lives that we may be strengthened with all Christ-like graces, pledged to set all captives free. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, lest we fail our call from thee. Lest we fail our call from Thee. Save us from weak resignation To the evils we deplore. Let the search for Thy salvation Be our glory evermore. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, serving thee whom we adore, serving thee whom we adore. Thank you for joining us for worship today. Sisters and brothers, and now may the one who is faithful to all be with us all. As we depart this blessed place, may we be a blessing to every place we go until we gather again. Go in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Answer God's call. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. When we Shining as the sun, we've no less.
Thank you.